Hello, Brittany Ann here, and welcome to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, where we challenge, encourage, and most importantly, equip you to be all in as a Christian woman, wife, and mother. Well, if you were somebody who watches the news and you were watching the news a few years ago, you may have seen news reports about the Charleston massacre. Basically, a white supremacist walked into a church, an African-American church in Charleston, South Carolina, and opened fire and killed nine people. Well, today on the podcast, I actually get to interview a family member of one of the people who was involved in this shooting, and we are talking about all the things. We have such an interesting and just open, honest conversation, both about what happened that night and how she was involved with that, as well as just a conversation about the topic of race here in America and what it's really like and all the racial inequalities that are still going on in America. This is something that I really wanted to talk about because obviously I am not a black woman and I don't know what it's like. But as Christians, we do need to be having this conversation so that we can just know and understand and love and treat each other better. And so this was just, I could have talked with her all day. And so hopefully you will enjoy this conversation too. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sharon, for speaking with us today. Um, I really just want to dive in and learn more about your story and everything that happened. I'm sure you include a lot of it in the book, but will you just give us a little bit of background on how you were involved with everything that happened in the Charleston massacre? What happened for those of us who, you know, it's been quite a while now, so we, you know, might not remember all the details. Can you just fill us in a little bit in uh, what happened and how you were involved? On June 17th, 2015, a young white man walked into Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, right before they were preparing for their regular Bible study that happens on Wednesday nights. Hours earlier, the church was filled of people because the church was having their quarterly conference where the different churches from around the Charleston area get together to discuss their calendars and business. A discussion uh, started about whether they would cancel the Bible study, and it was determined that they would not cancel the Bible study that night, so the Bible study went on. They welcomed him into the church, and they sat in a circle. They actually studied the chapter of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, the story of the parable, the sower, the parable of the sower. Uh, From my understanding, he sat there, he listened. And after about an hour, they gathered to um, dismiss. They were holding hands in a circle. And he pulled out his Glock 45 and started shooting. I learned about this while I was at work in Dallas, Texas, because I lived in Dallas, Texas at that time. I worked as a trauma ER chaplain, working the 3 to 11 shift, and received uh, several missed phone calls from my daughter. Well, I, it, it, it's kind of, um, oh, it's a lot of uh, in-between stuff. You know, like, I was working with a family whose grandfather had died, and I needed to go back and get some paperwork from my office, because for some reason, I didn't have it with me that night, and that's kind of unusual for me, because I usually travel with the paperwork that I would need for a death notification, but on that particular night, I did not have my paperwork, and I needed to go back to my office. So I excused myself, went back to my office, and um, 
I say the Holy Spirit led me to my telephone that was on my desk charging. And when I got to my telephone, I noticed that I had several missed calls from my daughter, which kind of automatically put me on edge because uh, I just wouldn't normally have missed calls from her back to back. So that alerted me that something was going on. So I returned my daughter's call. And she said to me that she had received a call from my nephew, John Quill, in Charleston, that he had learned something had happened at the church. So my first question to her was, what church? And she said, Granny's church. She said, John Quill didn't have any information other than something had happened and that they were going to go down to the church to try to find out what had happened. So I told my daughter, okay. Uh, I went back upstairs to continue pastoral care to the family that I was working with and kind of hurried through. Um, this particular family had uh, expected the death of the grandfather. So there was not a lot of... Uh, pastoral care that, you know, they needed. They were already kind of um, accepting of the death. You know, we did say a prayer. I gave them all the information that they would need, and I hurried back to my office. From that point, I started making telephone calls. I, I called my baby sister, Nadine, to ask her had she heard anything and at that point she said she hadn't so after that it was waiting trying to get phone calls uh being nervous about what was going on in charleston and i'm so far away in dallas so finally um i kind of uh was just so nervous and upset that i actually left my job earlier than normal i I probably left maybe around 10 o'clock in which there was central time between Texas and the East Coast. So I was an hour uh, behind them. But it wasn't until I got home, maybe I guess I got home about 1030, uh, 1045, that I turned the news on. And at that time, they were still saying that it was an incident that happened in the church. They weren't really giving out a whole lot of details. And um, so the night stretched on. It stretched on and maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I get a telephone call from the, uh, the FBI chaplain giving me information that my mother was killed in the church. I can't even imagine trying to, you know, be at work and have things you you know, are supposed to be doing and to get a phone call like that, that I had watched some of the news coverage, um, not the day that it happened, but since then. And it, oh my gosh, it was really difficult to watch just to see um, everything that had happened. How did you and your family cope with everything in the days and months afterwards? Well, like I said, I lived in Dallas, Texas. So I was not even in Charleston so initially, I dealt with that kind of mind-blowing information on my own. It was a very hard thing to do. I, um, I just kind of wandered around my apartment trying to digest everything that happened. I continued to watch the news 24-7 because somehow in my mind, I thought maybe this thing was just not really real. I didn't want to miss anything, uh, glean any kind of information, trying to even think about what to pack, what to carry, making a reservation. These things were done in a fog state of mind. The, one of the things I knew that I just needed to get to Charlotte, North Carolina first, because that's where my children live. And I knew once I got to Charlotte to be with my children that I would have some support. So I actually uh, got into Charlotte Friday night and we left early Saturday morning going to Charleston. So I actually didn't get 
into Charleston proper until that Saturday. And what day was it that the shooting happened? Wednesday late, uh, Wednesday night. Okay, so that's quite a gap then. That would be really difficult to be away from your family with all of these things going on. I wanted to ask you, I know that you said that you were working in a hospital as a chaplain at this time, and I know that you have um, a family that was very involved in the church, so you must have been a Christian before this. But I was wondering, how did all of these events impact your faith? Was it really difficult? Did it distance you from God for a while? Or, you know, was it something that drew you closer to him? And what did that look like in the immediate sense? And then also as time went on? You know, that process of faith in God uh, was very impacted because it shook my soul. You know, as a person of faith, you automatically know that uh, God is there with you. you. You know that. But as a human person, as a daughter that had just gotten this horrific news, the first question is, how God? Why God? So now you're questioning God. Not that I lost faith, but I, I, I was confused in that space of faith time. It was like, how could this happen, God? And it, there was a time that I didn't pray because I didn't feel like what was prayer going to do? So it was just a very um, hectic, confusing time between relying on God and praying more than I've ever prayed. And then there was those times that I didn't even want to think about God because I felt like God had abandoned me. How could this happen to one of your servants, a person that has dedicated her life to serving other people and to bringing the good news of the gospel, yet I have to try with everything I have to be uh, that person when in my soul, that's not what I wanted to be. That is so understandable just to be feeling emotions like that. And I know that that's something a lot of people deal with. And I'm sure you know also um, through your work as well. But I'm just so glad you shared that because I'm sure there's so many people who are listening who are also struggling and wrestling with the same thing. So just to know that, you know, it's okay to have these times we are human where you're going to question, you know, what is going on. Um, and that's so normal. But how did you eventually pull out of that? Because I would imagine you're not still in the same kind of um, mentality today. One thing after uh, all of the media sensation, the funerals and everything, there was a time for at least six months I did not want to go to church. I did not want to be in crowds of people that knew me. I didn't want to get, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to hear any of those things. But I knew eventually that my faith and the support of my family, that I would get back to a point where I knew that no matter what, that God was going to be that support that I would have with me in my heart 24 seven, when I was lonely, when I was by myself, that that God would be the person that I could talk to and really knew my heart. And I didn't have to try to be strong. I didn't have to try to come up with the right answers or to make sure that I didn't hurt anybody's feelings by being abrupt. So I started to go back to church. I did not go back to uh, my home church in Charlotte that uh, I affirmed my call to ministry. I went to my ex-husband's church at where he played as a musician. And it was a big church, so I was able to go to that church and kind of get lost. And just to be able to fellowship and, and to strengthen that faith and know that no matter what you go through, even through this horrific thing that I've been through, that there is a body of people, there is the message of the gospel that can get you through anything. And that's such a great idea, too. I love how you mentioned, too, okay, you know, if you can't go to your church and face all of the people, go to a church. Um, there's so many out there, and you can just kind of sit and not have people talk to you for a little while, not to stay there forever, because you do also need those people around you, of course, you know, friends and family to offer their support um, and to let them help out. But 
um, I can definitely see how you would also need times to just be left alone um, and to be with the Lord as well. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit because there is a topic that I just personally um, have been really thinking about lately, and I know that you are going to be the perfect person um, to talk to this talk to about. So when I am on Instagram, somehow it just happened that I see so many things either, you know, not always directly in my feed, but all just around on Instagram that have to do with social justice issues. And one of them that I have seen a lot is issues of race inequality and all of that. And I will just be honest, as a, you know, white woman living in, you know, a little neighborhood in like in a bubble, basically, um, this is something that I'm aware that is happening but I don't know to what extent or what that looks like. So can you just give me some idea and perspective of, because I know that this was a racially charged hate crime that happened that your family had to deal with. Can you just give any insight or perspective on, you know, what that is like in America? What is going on? Do you know a lot? Just your perspective on that. Well, that's a heavy topic. It really, really is. And the only perspective that I could come out of is my African-American perspective. So, you know, from the beginning with uh, slavery and uh, the Middle Passage, uh, Jim Crow, uh, black people not being allowed to vote, the fight for education, it seems like after these years, we are still trying to get everyday America to see that we are people that uh, have been given God-given rights just like everybody else. And to have to continue to uh, fight for that right to be recognized as a person it continues to tap on your soul because you can't understand what is it that mainstream America can't accept. That there is this perception of automatically if you're black, then you're inferior. And that takes a toll. I mean, after all of these years, you just feel like, what is it that they can't understand? Uh, there are criminals, there are issues in every ethnic uh, portion of the United States. And somehow there continues to be this white privilege that says that we are superior and if we don't allow you these things, then we have that right. And I, I um, it hurts. It hurts us as a people that have worked hard to help build America to what it is, to have struggled and to uh, gain an education to find our place. And we are still feeling like we are just being targeted for who we are. And I, I hope not to sound like an angry black woman, but I have to admit... I am an angry black woman, angry because we still have to prove that we are worthy. Yeah, no, that's fine. I am, you know, definitely want to hear your perspective because it's something that I just, I, I don't know. I honestly, you know, I want to know more, but I just honestly, you know, we, all of us in America are raised slightly differently and in different um, atmospheres and with different like life conditions. So I, you know, I want to learn more. I know that what happened with the shooter, uh, I was watching the news coverage and it was just disgusting. I could barely stomach to watch. Um, just his lack of remorse and all of the things. And I don't want to trigger you with terrible memories because I'm sure that's very horrible and painful. But I want to talk about a little bit just on a day-to-day -day kind of basis because I would imagine that while there are people out there who are definitely very racist, for the average, you know, kind of American person wouldn't really consider themselves to be racist. But I would imagine that there are things that are happening or ways that people are, you know, responding where 
a lot of that is going on that we don't even realize. Do you have any examples of that? Something that, you know, I might not even know about because I didn't grow up in the same culture of how racism plays out on a just very normal day-to-day -day basis? So I would say this. Not every non-person of color is a racist person. You know, I, I understand that. But there are implicit biases that people have that they don't even understand in their minds. You know, like uh, you could be in a, a retail store and you come in, maybe you're not dressed to the nines. You're just looking like a regular uh, black person shopping in a store looking around. That salesperson is going to watch you the whole time you're there. And you know this. And you're, and in your mind, you're like, what do you think? I'm going to grab something and steal it? But those that type of activity puts you on alert because here you are watching me. Now, if another person of the same age, white, or whatever comes in and they're watch and they're shopping, she has an opportunity to walk around and browse and do what she like. But me, I have to be conscious of I'm being watched constantly. Or, I mean, there was something that happened yesterday that uh, blew up on Facebook about a young black girl having dreads at a private Christian school. Several white boys tussled her down to the ground and cut her hair, called her nappy and ugly names. So it's that continuing thing of because I'm different and my culture is different, then you can't be the same as I. You know, there's just so many biases that are just inbred in people. Like if we live on a different side of town, you might live in a gated community and I might live in an area where there might be crime. But is everybody that lives in that area a thug or a criminal? So these are things that are already inbred in the minds of people that they don't give a thought about the words that come out of their mouths or the uh the looks that you might get it's it's Brittany this is a heavy subject and um it continues to have to be worked on because i believe that until we can understand somebody else until we can look at the way we live in the ingrown ideas in our minds of who we are, we will continue to have this cultural vastness among each other and there will never be an understanding because nobody wants to really recognize their own biases. And black people, we have our biases too. But until we can get together as people, and the only way we can get together as people is we're going to have to be in spaces. We're going to have to allow the uncomfortable spaces and talk to really find a common ground of who we are as people and realize that we all want the same things. Maybe we go about it different, but when it comes down to it, everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be recognized. Everybody wants to be able to grow their family and educate their families and, and be the best citizens and people they could be. Yeah, and I 100% agree with that. And I love how you said a little bit ago that how there's such a systemic bias that you don't even think about. And I think that's a big part of the issue, which is why I wanted to have this conversation today, because we don't even realize. And I've seen so many things online where there's absolutely stereotypes that are inbred against like 
nationwide against people of color. There are absolutely stereotypes against women. There are absolutely stereotypes against men. So it's not saying that, you know, one group of people is any better or the other or anything like that, but just knowing and understanding like where these stereotypes come out. I had read something online that said, um, I think it was written by an African-American man. I don't remember. It was a while ago, but I think he was saying like, as somebody of color, he can't walk down the street with a hoodie up because that like is a signal and like things like that, that like I wouldn't have even thought of like, oh, just something that as a man of color, that's something you have to think of. And there's a lot of things I've been thinking about lately, you know, as women, there are a lot of things that we do that men don't even have to think of. So I think that's why it's just so important to have these conversations and say, okay, here's what it's like for me. Here's how this plays out. Here's, you know, just bringing light to these stereotypes, um, just so you can kind of realize how ridiculous that is. Like somebody's really gonna rob you because they have a hood on. Like, that's kind of ridiculous when you think about it. One of the things in the African-American communities now is a big thing where families, especially with young black men, have to have the talk. And the talk consists of how do you deal when you come upon a cop? How do you deal with the situation when you're stopped? That you're always going to, you know, be uh, careful about where do you place your hand? How do you talk to a cop? How do you have to really kind of uh, calm yourself because you don't want to do anything that would escalate anything because automatically, and this is just the way it is, that black men are a threat because they're black. So black families have to have these talks. My son is a well-educated professional psychologist that drives a nice car, lives in a very nice neighborhood. And he is not, not aware that he is still a black man. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I know, you know, as a white woman, my parents had to have different talks with me, but I just feel like there are talks that everybody has to have like this is what it looks like when you are in this community in this culture you know you have to follow rules that other people don't have and i'm not saying at all that that's right but just like so that people understand like hey yes i know slavery has been outlawed for a long time now but it's not over there's still so many things that are happening in the culture and rules that you have to follow or you know if you want things to go well for you you know depending on your gender and depending on the color of your skin and depending on your religion and all of these things that we just don't realize because we don't have these conversations yes so I want to talk because we are running out of time here. I want to talk more about your book for such a time as this. Will you tell us um, basically what your book is about, what all is included in it, who should read it, who it's for, um, basically all the information about your book? Well, I tell you what, I always kind of thought in my mind that I would write a book, that this book would probably would more likely just talk about my life and growing up in Charleston and what that kind of culture is because Charleston is a different kind of place in the South. Slavery was, you know, that was the place where the uh, slaves were shipped into and that kind of culture and, the, and things. But after uh, what happened in Charleston and the death of my mother and my cousins and what happened, I felt like I needed, uh, people to understand uh, that culture and what that uh, death in that church, in that place, the history of uh, Emmanuel Church, my growing up in Charleston and what formed me as a person of faith and the uh, willingness and wantingness to be able to be educated and uh, just not to be a a person that worked in the restaurants and um, kind of my life. Um, I've been through so many challenging things in my life. And the purpose of that book is to really let people know that no matter what you go through in your life, no matter what that is, that you could get on the other side of that, that your past is not always the representation of your whole life. 
And then on the end of the book, I talk about some things, lessons learned. And one of the things I said, it says, life has given me challenges and failures, good times and bad. Along my journey, I have known feelings of hopelessness, shame, guilt, and unworthiness. So there are things like the lessons I've learned, like you can't heal in isolation, that you have to trust your gut instinct and cling to your faith. So these are the type things, lessons through everything that I've been through and all of the traveling, going around the world, speaking about what happened in that church and my story. I wanted people to understand that these were just regular people trying to live a regular Christian life, doing the best they can, and that I was just a regular chaplain enjoying my life. But God had another thing that he needed for my life to do. And I wanted to chronicle that in a book and to let other people know that you, your story is worthy. And that if you get a chance to tell the story, people will find out through your story that their lives really aren't that much different than yours. So is your book primarily about the events surrounding the Charleston Massacre, or is it more your memoir of your entire life? It's kind of more of a memoir of my entire life that kinds of uh, where the, uh, the event that happened in Charleston kind of brings everything together about the walk that God would have me do. Like well, it says, sounds- for such a time as this. All of the things, all of the challenges that I've been through in my life brought me to this time and space to be able to tell that story and to walk through. Well, that sounds like a fascinating topic, and I definitely would encourage any of our listeners who would like to hear more about, you know, what happened, her perspective on this, and just her perspective on life and what it's like to be, um, such a wonderful Christian woman like she is. I would definitely encourage you to check out her book for such a time as this. Sharon, thank you so much for your willingness to come on the podcast today and to speak so openly and honestly about such an important topic. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. So unfortunately, that just about does it for today's episode. I would love to have just talked with her so much more in depth about more ways, um, that racial inequality is happening in our nation, what it looks like, how we can get involved. But I don't want to take up your entire day, so we had to cut it off there. But if you want to hear more on this topic, if you want to hear more about Sharon and her story, it is so interesting. I would highly encourage you to go check out her book. It came out earlier this year. You can get it wherever books are sold. Um, And it's called For Such a Time as This hope and forgiveness after the Charleston massacre. So if you want to hear more, definitely go check that out. I will link um, a link to that in the show notes where you can find it. And as always, if you have not already subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, what are you waiting for? We come back pretty much every other week at this point to bring you um, just great conversations with people about what does it look like to be a Christian woman? What does it look like to be a good Christian wife and a good Christian mom um, and how to be all in in our faith? So if that sounds like the kind of thing you are interested in, absolutely go ahead and subscribe right now. The link is in the show notes below, and I will talk to you again real soon. All right. Bye.